Okay, good morning. Good to have you this morning. <laughs> okay, everybody have a syllabus? If you don't have one, they're right at the back back there. You can pick one up. It's going to be a hot day today, isn't it? Yeah. So it's nice and cool in here. This is the only place you can wear a coat <laughs> during 90 degrees outside. Amen. <laughs> you got one, don't you, Okay. <laughs> That's true. Well, she's so thin. Thin people get cold easier than uh, my radiator. <laughs> okay. Glad you're here. Acts chapter 2. By the way, this is vacation weekend. We have a lot of people gone on vacation and that. So we're glad you're all are here. We really are. For you people that are watching us on live stream, I think a week ago we had 300 and something people watching our Sunday school class. And so that's a blessing. Yeah. Huh? Hi, Kathy, wherever you are. Hello from your hubby. Amen. That's sweet, wasn't it? She says she's sending you divorce papers. Okay, now go on. <laughs> I'm kidding, Dan. Okay, Peter's in the midst going for his message. And uh, he's speaking to the Jewish people. Remember, there's not one Gentile present uh, unless they're a proselyte. And uh, this is to the people of Israel. And why, the reason that's so important, remember that most of Christendom, they believe that the church started in Acts chapter 2. Okay? And we don't agree with that. We believe it started with Paul at mid-Acts. So uh, what's he doing here then? Well, you remember when Christ came, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom that was prophesied throughout the past years, through all the prophets and so on. And he said it's at hand, it's near, it's close. If you believe, then you'd only have seven years of tribulation. If you believe you'd only have seven years of tribulation, then I would return. And then I would take care of your enemies and set up the kingdom. Just real simple. And so, uh, but they could not offer the kingdom at the time back here in the Gospels. And the reason they couldn't, a couple reasons. One, he had to die on the cross. And uh, that was really important. Shed his blood in order to be able to have a new covenant for the nation of Israel. Now remember us, the body of Christ, we're not associated with covenants. Uh, we're under grace, and ours is different. But uh, not only that, for them to be able to then offer the kingdom in Israel, he had to die first, and also he had to ascend on high in order to be glorified, in order to be exalted. And uh, remember, he couldn't send the Spirit of God down to man in Acts chapter 2 until... He had been exalted, seated on the right hand of the Father, right? And so a lot of things going on here in Acts. And once again, uh, early Acts is not to us, the body of Christ. And there's a lot of things going on that never has gone on since that time. Okay? So we'll get through it, and I hope it'll be a blessing. Uh, Peter here, he's quoting Joel. Joel chapter 2 says, just where it's underlined, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then he goes on to state, and I will show wonders, wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. When is the great, terrible day of the Lord? When is that? 
Okay, that's over here, and it continues through the tribulation. That's great. When he pours his wrath out upon the world. So, you pick up two things real fast. The Spirit of God has to be poured up, poured out, so people, and especially what we're talking about here, Israel, to be saved. Then they go into the tribulation, the terrible, great and terrible day of the Lord. The Spirit first, then the tribulation. So you have here the coming of the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2. If Israel would believe, then they would go into the tribulation. Okay? Now, Peter in Acts 2 quotes Job to show it was being, Job chapter 2 was being fulfilled at Pentecost. He says, this is that. The passage of Job was about Pentecost and the trib, tribulation. It is about the Spirit being poured out, then going into the tribulation, the sun into darkness and the moon into blood. The question that I wrote down here, has this come to pass yet? Do we see these signs today? Is the day of the Lord being ushered in now? And the answer is no. Not at all. Isaiah talks about this, just where it's underlined. How, how ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. I will punish the world for their evil. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I, I skipped that a little bit, I'm sorry. Verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. So when Peter in Acts 2 is saying, Job, there were other prophets who said the same thing. And they prophesied about that, that the coming of the Lord that day, and so when he says this is that, he believed that that prophecy was beginning to be fulfilled. Okay? He had a reason for saying what he did. Okay? And by the way, when you're back there in prophecy, who is prophecy associated with? The nation of Israel, not the body of Christ, which we're in. It's to the people of Israel. Three. Why hasn't this happened yet? It is because God had a secret. He had a secret purpose that Peter knew nothing about. As Israel, with her signs, began to diminish, vanish, V-A-N, vanish in Acts after the stoning of Stephen, in Acts 7. What happened in Acts 7? They stoned Stephen, and what did that mark? What did, what did that mark? Earl? The rejection of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and then in Acts, the Holy Spirit who had come down. And so it was a complete rejection of the Godhead. Israel said they will not believe that Jesus is the Christ Messiah, okay? And God, from that moment on, began, not immediately, he began to set Israel aside. Israel are the sign people. So if you put the sign people aside, what also goes away with them? The signs. Is that, doesn't that make sense? Okay. In stoning of Stephen, God raises up Paul 
to unveil the new dispensation of grace. And when he raises Paul up, there's this transition. Israel diminishes, the body of Christ increases. So by the time you get to the end of Acts 28, by the time you get to Acts 28, at that time, it's just the body of Christ going out. Okay? So I think that's clear as mud. So we got that. Notice what Paul says, where it's underlined, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And the reason that's so different, law is not involved for the believer. It's not a life of obedience to law. It's a life of following the grace of God that changes one's behavior. Amen? For with this, God ceased in Acts the coming day of wrath, the tribulation. In other words, here in Acts, the Spirit of God's been poured out. If Israel believe, then the tribulation would get ready to come in. But since Israel did not believe, God withdrew the coming of the tribulation period at that time. Okay? And he is not saving whosoever calls, now get this, as predicted by Joel and preached by Peter. So in the Jewish mind, you have the Spirit of God coming down, getting ready to go into the kingdom, that's, or the tribulation, I'm sorry, to go into the tribulation. That's why he said, sell everything you have. It's not going to do you any good having it. And you're going in tribulation. You're going to be running the whole time, and I'm going to have to take care of you in the wilderness. Tribulation and then kingdom. Today, he offers whosoever calls according to his IN interruption of Israel's prophecy program predicted by Joel and the ushering in of the mystery body program and dispensation of grace. Back here, when it was whosoever will, it was through... Israel's prophetic program under law. But God interrupts, sets that aside. Today, it's whosoever will under the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, the mystery program. The whosoever will hear believes in the prophetic message. The whosoever will hear believes in the Gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay? There are two different whosoever wills. Okay? Let me see here. Today, salvation is offered to all as a free gift of God because of the work of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection. And when Peter speaks here in Acts 2, he knew nothing about he knew nothing about the accomplishments of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why their gospel message was different than the message that God revealed to Paul for us. That makes sense. I mean, that's okay. This message was first used by Paul in Acts 9. How was that? He was saved by grace, if anybody. Then revealed to him the accomplishments of it all to share with others who also would become members of the body. Paul says where it's underlined, 
to establish you according to my gospel. Now, let me just say, people say, man, he was arrogant. He calls it his gospel. Well, the truth is, it was his gospel. It wasn't the 12 apostles' gospel they were preaching. It was a new gospel God revealed first to Paul to preach. That's why he says, my gospel, and that differentiated between the twelve's gospel and Paul's gospel. Okay? It's kept, and I notice, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Before the apostle Paul, nobody knew about this grace gospel that Paul preached. It was never introduced. It was never known. It was a secret. So that tells me something. That tells me in Acts 2, the body of Christ could not have been there yet. Huh? Because Paul, chapter 9, he's the man. Okay? But now is made manifest, and it's about faith, faith alone. Paul says this, Galatians 1, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? I'm going to give you a message nobody's ever heard, Paul. Paul. You're the first one to experience it. Saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Mankind never had heard that kind of thing. You're going to be the first one, and I'm going to use you to share it. Verse 15, uh, words underlined, uh, of whom I am chief, that in me first, for a pattern, to them which hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul says, I'm the first one to experience this new gospel message personally, and I am the pattern that the rest of people in the body of Christ, that's how they have to get saved. The same way I did, not knocked down on the road, but by pure grace. And God reveals to him how that came about through the finished work of Christ, of course. Romans 2, 16. God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The gospel that I personally received by revelation through Jesus Christ. He said, that's my gospel. No, Acts 2.21, who are the whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord that Peter is talking about? Who he's talking about is the remnant. The remnant. That small, true little flock. <laughs> Those people who really believe that Christ is the Messiah. Notice Joel 2. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, and then, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So out of Israel, instead of Israel turning full as a nation, whole as a nation, to believe that Christ Jesus is the Christ Messiah, only a remnant will believe. And just like today, you might look at all the big mega churches and saying thousands and thousands of people are getting saved and so on. I still believe, along with less, that a very small portion of people who say they're Christians are not Christians because they did not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The true gospel. The true gospel. Paul's gospel. 
the mystery gospel held secret in bay until God raises up Paul. Okay? And that means, once again, the gospel was not back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had a gospel to the Jews, Israel, but not to us today. Okay? Now notice Acts 2.40. He, Peter says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Peter tells these Jewish people to get away from Israel's apostasy and to become a part of the remnant, the little flock of true messianic believers. Their salvation and deliverance were to be found in the remnant's Messiah's message. Messiah message. They never realized the full salvation while they live because Theirs, Israel's, is attached to their national blessings. You know, when we say eternal life, we think of going to heaven and a lot of those things, right? But Israel, their life everlasting, it was always associated with the kingdom. Back here, they never could receive full salvation because it's associated with their nation. When the nation is in Israel with Christ sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning. To them, that was eternal life. And by the way, they didn't receive full salvation because their sins are not forgiven until Christ returns to the earth at the end of the tribulation. So there's a couple of reasons Israel did not receive full salvation at that time, okay? Now, they never realized, national, Israel as a nation does not experience their full salvation until Jesus returns and sets up his or their kingdom. When a Jew was called and did call, they followed Acts 2, 37, 38. In other words, back then when a Jew was saved, they had a procedure they had to follow in order to be saved. Say by faith that Jesus is the Christ Messiah, yes, proven by what was required of them. Uh, Roger, if you wouldn't mind, uh, pull up uh, Acts 2, 37, 38 for me. Now, here's Peter preaching. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked, convicted in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So their order was they needed to have faith, of course, and then repent of their national sin of rejecting God throughout the ages, repent of their national sin, be water baptized. Then after their water baptized, then they would receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's not the way we're saved today. We're saved today the moment we believe in the gospel. But they didn't. They weren't. Okay? Now, notice verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. One, the things that Christ did in the Gospels, the miracles, were the precise verification to what was taking place then. His miracles were exactly what the prophets said would take place when Messiah showed up. What should have been the results, by the way? What should have happened? They should have just screamed, Messiah's here. 
He verified what all the prophets said. When he showed up, he did those miraculous things. And that was an indication he's here. Okay? But they had become religious, traditionalist, apostate people. And they had, the religious leaders had positions. They were afraid that if they would follow him, they'd lose all of that. You remember he said to the rich man, sell everything you have and come follow me. Well, they didn't want to do anything like that, did they? Okay? Two, remember John the Baptist, well, he's in prison, asking the disciples if Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? the one that's prophesied, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Who Jesus Christ was should have been easily, easily identified by them. Lost apostate leaders have a hard time seeing truth. Just like Christendom today. They're so wrapped up in their denomination, their tradition, their religious creeds, their versions of the Bible. On and on it goes. And for somebody to say, well, here's the truth, they have a hard time seeing truth. Isn't that true? That's a fact, okay? Verse 23, Him, be de Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have, uh, have crucified and slain. Does Peter say the death, burial, resurrection of Christ was good news? Like we do? Here's some good news. You're a rotten sinner on your way to hell. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ will love you so much, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose. Good news for you. Now you have an opportunity to be saved. Does it sound like Peter's saying that at all? Okay. The answer is no. Peter charges, accuses them of having slain Christ by their wicked hands. Peter wanted to convict them of their guilt, of their guilt for the crucifixion of their Messiah. Then he tells them he is alive. Uh-oh. <laughs> you rotten murderers, you slain the very Messiah that was prophesied, but I have something to tell you. He's back to life. And these guys standing there, we help crucify him, crucify him. He's alive. Okay? Peter is not preaching the gospel of grace, nor that we have redemption through his blood. Peter is blaming them for failing to know who Christ was and for being guilty of murdering their own Messiah. Not a very happy message, is it? Not here, but one day in the future, Israel will recognize this, their great sin. They will then mourn what they did as a nation, and only... One-third of Israel will be saved, which will be the remnant, the true Israel. The true Israel is always the remnant, right? Because the majority never believe, just like today. Now notice Zechariah where it's underlined. Zechariah 12.10. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, Christ, 
and they shall, what? Mourn. Revelation 1, 7. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, the Israelites, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Zechariah 13, just where it's underlined, two parts, two-thirds, therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, the trib, and will refine them as silver and so on. A word to under it. They shall call on my name. I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. So one day in the tribulation, one-third of Israel will believe that Jesus Christ back here indeed was the true Messiah. But two-thirds will perish because they won't believe. Okay? The one-third is the remnant. How many of you understand that? Okay? Okay, very good. Three. Him, Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It does not say or imply that God had caused or forced them to crucify Christ. God says they were wicked in so doing. The simple truth is that the all-knowing God knew what wicked men would do to his son. Yet he delivered him into their hands to fulfill his purpose. Probably a great example would be God had a purpose for Israel. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, went to Egypt, rose up finally the second highest in Egypt, right behind Pharaoh. And he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God had a purpose in using your evil. Likewise, the Israelites, they're wicked. They meant it for evil, but God had a purpose for good through it. Amen? In the slaying, in the slaying of his son, he had a twofold purpose. Now this is important. For this one cross, one related to Israel prophecy and the other one related to the mystery body program. Peter's prophecy program is what we have here in Acts 2. Christ dies on the cross, buried, rose again, and he's pre being presented as the resurrected Messiah to the nation of Israel. One purpose. Israel's prophetic program. But God knew they're going to reject. So he had a second purpose. And the second purpose is interrupt Israel's program and create a new program called the dispensation of grace and the purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection is different from the purpose of Israel. Okay? God purposed to use the cross for Israel in early Acts to offer them their kingdom. But because of his omniscience, he knew Israel would reject Christ then as their Messiah. So he purposed Israel's crucifying of her Messiah to someday touch and break their heart. This will happen during the tribulation and at its end when Christ returns that we just talked about. It's not breaking their heart here. But one day over here, it will. Okay? 
Where am I? The fact that God de determined for his son to die on the cross does not lessen the Israelites' guilt of murder. Their wickedness chose to kill Jesus and they will be held accountable one day. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it death. Peter informs the Jewish mass that even though they had killed, murdered Christ, God raised him up and they are going to have to deal with him. There's the problem. This Christ you murdered and slayed by wicked hands. God the Father has raised him up and you're going to have to deal with him now. He's alive. Two, it is not possible for death to hold the Lord. He is the sinless Son of God who had no sin. He is life. Just where it's underlined, the Lord says, I have power to lay it down, his life, and I have power to take it again, to raise it up. Revelation, I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Hebrews there, just where it's underlined, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, how did the devil have the power of death, by the way? How, how, how did that go? When Adam sent, yes. But the devil had something that he uses. Non-believers go to hell, that's true. He had the law. And he could point out, you violated the law. They violated the law. The law says death. But when Christ rose from the grave, he took that authority away from them because he began to work on grace. Amen? Now, verse 25 through 28, I've got to hurry here. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul, David, in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, Christ, to see corruption. One, Peter is pressing the point and the truth of Christ's resurrection. By the way, he uses David's name. Did that have any relationship with the nation of Israel that he's talking to. They loved, they loved David, okay? Christ's resurrection, uh, uh, the truth of Christ to the, this guilty generation of Jews. They are standing in a present danger and, now to get this, of perhaps continuing on to committing the unpardonable sin. In other words, in Acts, early Acts, they're from two, Acts 2 to 7, they are on dangerous ground. The reason they're on dangerous ground, back here, Christ on the cross said, Father, forgive them. And in Luke, it talks about giving them one extra year. They're... They're on dangerous ground. They have one year in early Acts to believe that Jesus is the Christ Messiah. And if they did not, since it's the power of the Spirit of God, they were rejecting the Spirit of God, and that is the unpardonable sin. And they would commit it. And Israel committed that sin. You can't commit the unpardonable sin because it wasn't to or for you. It was to the people of Israel, the apostate nation, and they committed it, okay? 
Two, how was it that David, David's and Christ's soul did not see corruption in hell? Why? What compartment were they in? Paradise. That's why. <laughs> Remember hell in hell? All die and go to hell. It's separated. One side torment. One for lost people. The other side paradise. Abraham's bosom. Right? Okay. Verse 29 through 33. Men and brethren, Jews, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he both uh, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Me and Kenny Arthur got to see David's uh, a thing in Israel, uh, his sepulcher, his tomb. Uh, they don't allow you to do that anymore. Uh, we were in there, had a beautiful silk, blue, uh, golden thing uh, over the casket thing. And uh, I took a picture, and this rabbi went nuts. Uh, he was an old man. I think he was drunk. Actually, I believe he was a rabbi drunk. I said, nothing never changes for them, does it? Huh? Like days of old, <laughs> days to day. <laughs> but anyway, verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, David, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ... David was promised through his loins this Messiah one day would sit on his thrones. And so since he would die, he would not see corruption, he would be raised. Why? Because God promised he's going to sit on the throne. He's going to rise from the dead. Okay? And you can look at the rest of the verses sometime. Number one, Christ was raised for one main purpose, and that is to sit on David's throne, to be king in the ages to come. I've studied that out a little bit, and both David and Christ rule and reign in Jerusalem. But Christ will be the head ruler over all other rulers, okay? Along with the 12 apostles, that's going to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Well, Christ is going to have his throne there too. Two, understand the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was interpreted by Peter as proof, positive, that Jesus Christ has been exalted to the Father's right hand and, he, and that he is king and his kingdom will be restored. When will it be restored? At the end of the tribulation. So what is going to happen to those Jews who killed the king? This is a warning about God's wrath falling on them. What could these people who murdered the king, the Messiah, what could happen? Well, they could repent. <laughs> That's what Peter's asking for, right? There's a way out for them. Verse 34, 35, For David is not, in sin, is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. That's during the trib. Peter says to them, You crucified him, the Father raised him, and set him at his own right hand. He has sent us out as witness to you that he is God Messiah. He is going to come back and make his enemies his footstool. The next time he stands, it will be to pour out his wrath on unbelieving Jews and the world. The next thing on God's calendar is to make you, Israel, his enemies. You apostate ones. You are his target to be destroyed. I wrote, can you imagine how some of them felt from hearing Peter's message. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter is not preaching the gospel of grace here. He is not preaching on the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ that he will accept 
you killers. Peter is saying Israel is guilty of crucifying Christ, but he rose and is on the Father's right hand. He is anticipating his return when he will burn you well done. And you better get right. What would you do? Huh? Well, we'll find out next week. Okay? Okay. I'm sorry I had to hurry up and get through that through the end there. Anybody learn anything today? Anything? Hope so. Hope it's a blessing. We'll see you in the next service. It starts at 1035. God bless you.